When is the right time to buy real estate? Timing the market is a common practice amongst buyers, but is it the right one? In this video, we interview Jason Hartman, an experienced real estate investor and coach who's been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. Given his experience, Jason has a unique pulse on the market and will provide you game-changing tips that you don't want to miss. My name is Aria Herrera, your fellow data scientist with the Tech and Real Estate channel. We bridge the gap between real estate and technology. All right, let's get started. Hey, Jason, welcome to the channel. So happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. And I know we have a lot to discuss today, including answering some burning questions like when is the right time to invest? But before we get into that, we'd love to hear a little bit about your background. Yeah, I, uh, I've been in the real estate business since I was 19 years old. I got my license just right before my 20th birthday when I was in, my, uh, in uh, Long Beach City College. And um, I started selling real estate part time because I wanted to become an investor. And I thought if I just get around it and I just kind of like learn the business, I never thought I'd you know, really do so well in the brokerage business, which I did uh, and built a career in that. But investing has always been my first love. And uh, uh, I had a traditional real estate company. And back in 2005, I sold that to Coldwell Banker. And um, I've been in the investor only business ever since. And basically the main thing I do, I do a lot of things like many entrepreneurs nowadays, but the main thing I do is I help investors buy properties nationwide. And so we uh, get a lot of investors that come to us after watching my YouTube channel or listening to my podcast. And then they say, you know, I want to build a real estate portfolio. Where do I invest? How do I invest? You know, and, uh, and that's what we help them do. So we basically help them match them up with, uh, with sellers of properties in different markets that we like and recommend. And then they buy the properties and then we support them with their portfolio and, and uh, everything that comes up along the way. Great, tremendous experience. And you really have a great pulse in the market as you're very data-driven yourself. Um, so I would love to start off with just asking, what have you seen in terms of the market? Where do you see it shifting? Uh, maybe some highlights as of recent. Yeah, you know, we are in a really interesting market aerial, probably one of the most interesting markets uh, I've ever seen in my career. And why do I say it's interesting, right? I say it's interesting because uh, the cost of mortgage money has pretty much tripled. And everybody practically thought there would be a big crash. And, you know, if looking at history, they probably would have been right. Right. Because, you know, if you think, well, hey, the cost of money goes up, uh, nobody can afford a house anymore or you know, much fewer people can. And uh, so that's going to cause supply to increase and demand to go down. And uh, we're just going to see prices go down if that happens. But they got it wrong. And the reason they got it wrong is because ever since we saw the interest rates increase and spike up so dramatically two years ago, um, we've had a much smaller number of sales. So transaction volume is way down, yet prices still keep going up. And a lot of people are puzzled by that. And they still say there's going to be a crash. And I'm here to tell you, there is no data supporting a crash thesis yet. Right. Someday there will be a crash. Of course, there are always cycles in the economy. But right now, there's just no data to support that idea. And so the, I think one of the core reasons they got it so wrong is that if you look at the housing stock in the United States, there's about 140 million housing units, approximately. And uh, transaction volume, you know, we might see that be from four to six million transactions every year on a normal year. OK, so that's how much housing stock is turning over every year. 140 million total, you know, four, five, six million every year are going to sell. Okay. That's the sort of the typical thing. So since the rates went up so much, sales volume is way down. So since the time we saw the rate increase, very few people have transacted, maybe just over 5 million, give or take. So the, everybody who was predicting the crash was focused on the 5 million. And they were thinking, okay, if someone wants to enter the housing market now, it's very unaffordable. And they're right. That's true. But what they got wrong is the holders of the other 135 million houses. They totally missed that. It's shocking how they screwed that up in their thinking. Because those people 
are not in any distress at all. Those people are extremely comfortable. They've got these incredibly low rate mortgages. We literally during the COVID era, and I kid you not, this is not hype when I, what I'm about to say. There are interest rate studies and charts that go back 5,000 years to Egyptian times, okay? Because there's always been a cost of money, right? Everybody who had capital thought, you know, if I'm going to give you my capital, you should give me some return on it, some extra back, right? That's interest. And so uh, we had the lowest interest rates in five millennia. <laughs> it's shocking to think about, okay? Yeah. Um, and certainly the lowest in modern times. So now you have tens of millions of people that have these ultra cheap mortgages and they have 28 years left on them. They're very comfortable. And the one, as I always say on my channel, the one thing you must have if you want to have a real estate crash is you must have millions of distressed homeowners mm -hmm. who become millions of distressed home sellers. And now we have the complete opposite of that. We have tens of millions of extremely comfortable homeowners that have no interest in becoming home sellers. And without an increase in inventory, at the same time having a reduction in demand, you're not gonna have prices decline. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Prices have been going up, even though housing affordability has gone down and interest rates have gone up. And everybody just got that wrong because they focused on people entering the market rather than the vast majority of people, not the 5 million, the 135 million that already owned the stock that weren't willing to part with it. That's how they got it so wrong. And they're continuing to get it wrong. All of these people calling for a, a real estate crash are just, they're just out of their mind. It, it's just not here yet. It'll happen someday. Okay. Someday there will be another real estate crash. No doubt. Absolutely. But the problem is that a lot of people with this mentality of, hey, I'm going to preserve my cash. I'm going to keep my powder dry. They say, you know, that's the old saying, right? Keep your powder dry. And they're waiting to try and time the market. Yeah. And they think, okay, well, if real estate prices go down by 10 or 20% and I just wait, then, you know, I'm going to pounce at that time. Here, there are many problems with this idea. Number one problem is nobody knows where the top and the bottom is, right? Because when you're at the bottom, you feel like it's just going to get worse. All the news is so negative and you just feel like, oh my God, this is just never going to end. You know, everything's going to just keep going down. The economy is going to collapse. So you never know when you're at the bottom and you never know when you're at the top either, okay? Market timing is a fool's errand. There have been just countless studies on this idea in every asset class under the sun. People who to try to time the market in precious metals, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, cryptocurrencies, it never works. Market timing just does not work, okay? What works in investing is to buy good investments that make sense the day you buy them and to hold them and not agonize over the cycles. Now, you know, you can try and time it a little bit maybe, but, you know, the market's pretty, it's got its own intelligence and yeah. it's probably not going to let you win. And look, if you think about it, you know, uh, it would be a decent argument to say that the person or the company or the entity that has the most information is going to win in the, in the effort to time the markets, right? So who has the most information? Well, I would argue the most information in the world is held by the United States Federal Reserve Bank, yeah, our central bank. Jerome Powell probably has more information available to him than any other human on earth about the economy, okay? Like, I don't have that much information. You don't have that much. Yeah. He has insider information. And they can't figure it out, okay? <laughs> he doesn't know sure. exactly when to raise or lower interest rates. like. This is this is the central planners that run the world economy, basically. And and they don't know, okay? Like what what makes you know John Doe, real estate investor, think he can figure it out? He it's yeah. just a stupid thing, okay? So just buy good investments and hold on to them. And you know, stop agonizing about timing the market, everybody. It just doesn't work. Okay. I so. completely agree. And if it comes to timing, maybe seasonality, if you want to buy during the summer months when it's, you know, yeah. 
more. A little, a little bit. Stuff. There are some, you can nibble around the edges of it. Sure. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, awesome. I would love to see some of the data that you put together um, yeah. that kind of summarizes the market as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we talk about the market, right, that's a dangerous idea too, because there is no the market, right? A country as large and diverse as the United States, there is no such thing as a national housing market. There are about 400 metropolitan areas in the U.S. There are about 3,100 counties in the U.S. There are over 9,000 cities in the U.S., and there are countless neighborhoods. The old saying in real estate is that all real estate is local. All real estate is local, right? And even in really small countries, you know, it's hard to argue that they even have a national housing market. I mean, look at a tiny country like, you know, Luxembourg, for example, right? Um, you know, it's tiny. I drove through it once. It's pretty small. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, even they have little differences in their real estate market. I am sure I'm no expert, but I'm, I'm sure they do. But it really helps if you break the markets down rather than by geography, more into market type. And in the US and all around the world, there are three basic types of markets. And I'll just share my screen here to show you this and show right. you some empirical data about this. Uh, so three basic types of markets. There are linear markets, and these are the markets that we like and recommend. These are slow and steady markets. They're characterized by lower prices, better cash flow, and more stability. You have cyclical markets. And cyclical markets are the markets that get all the attention, but they're not really the best markets to invest in by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and these markets, uh, if you're looking at a chart of past appreciation or depreciation, they look like a roller coaster. It's ups and downs, okay? That's that's a cyclical market. Now, what are the linear markets? What are some examples of those? What are the cyclical markets? What are some examples of those? Well, since most of the country and most of the world is a linear market, I'll just tell you what the cyclical markets are, okay? Because everything else is pretty linear. So right. the cyclical markets are the trophy markets, right? They're the markets that everybody has heard of, everybody knows about. Probably you live in a cyclical market, most likely, okay? And these are markets like where I grew up, Los Angeles, California, okay? Really anything on the West Coast of the United States is probably a cyclical market, okay? The expensive Northeastern markets, New York, Boston, Washington, D.C., cyclical markets. Where I live now in South Florida, Miami, Palm Beach, cyclical markets, all right? Um, then there's one other type of market. I did say there were three, and it is the market that is in between the two, and that's called a hybrid market. So everything is pretty much a, cycl a, a linear market other than cyclicals I mentioned, but then the hybrids, there are a few standouts there. Now, Atlanta used to be a linear market, but uh, during the appreciation of the past decade, it became more of a hybrid market. Austin, Texas would be considered a hybrid market. Denver, Colorado, hybrid market, right? These markets aren't super expensive like the cyclical markets I mentioned, but they do have higher land values and higher fluctuations. So how do these look on charts? Um, one of our markets for many, many years now has been Memphis, Tennessee. I've owned many properties there. I've helped many investors buy in Memphis. And if you look at this chart of appreciation, you see it has, you know, it has some ups and downs, but compared to what I'm going to show you, they're not very pronounced. You know, it's overall, yeah. the trend line is pretty consistent. Um, Indianapolis, another market that we've done a lot of business in and recommend. I've owned many properties in Indy. And this is also a linear market. Linear markets are boring. Okay. Cyclical markets. Here's where I grew up. This is Los Angeles, California. It's up, down, up, down. It's crazy, right? Yeah. It's just crazy. And, you know, the get rich quick stories in real estate happen mostly in cyclical markets, not linear markets. The problem is in a cyclical market, you could also be very wrong and you could go broke very quickly because you'll never have a sustainable investment with good cash flow to sustain you through the ups and downs in the market. And that's why we recommend linear markets. They're just much more prudent, 
they just make a lot more sense. Um, now, if you look at um, this appreciation map of the country, you can again see how everybody got it wrong. <laughs> okay, and uh, you know properties have been appreciating, but it's interesting to note that some slight depreciation occurred. Uh, and I, by the way, I think this is through Q3 of last year. Okay, just so you know, it's a, it's a one year through Q3 of last year. Um, and you see that these cyclical markets on the West Coast did have some minor depreciation, okay? A lot of that was really led by San Francisco, which has become such a complete disaster, right? Uh, so, uh, and Seattle also another complete disaster. And then you look at this area, really minor depreciation here in the Western states, and then the rest of the country, uh, appreciation. Now, you know, some of these cyclical areas actually did appreciate too, okay? And they did pretty well. Uh, but for my money, linear, boring, consistent markets are the best choices. Excellent. Yeah, I completely can see that rationale. Um, like you said, those cyclical markets, even though they can have high cash flow at times, um, there could be instances throughout the time of you holding the property that you may turn out a loss as well. So those yeah. linear markets are more preferred. Yeah, you know, the linear markets allow you to be a sustainable investor. And they don't, you know, you never want to be in a position where you're forced to sell a property at an inopportune time. And all too often that happens to people in cyclical markets because the cash flow, the rent to value ratios there are terrible. And you can never sustain the property through a down market. Whereas in the linear markets, your rent to value ratio is going to be very good for you as an investor. And you're going to be able to hold on to that property through thick and thin. Makes sense. Yeah. And I saw that you had their home prices. What are some other attributes that someone could look at when determining um, maybe a market that they want to invest in? Maybe it's a linear market. Uh, what are some other factors? Well, landlord friendliness would be another factor for investors. I mean, obviously, we want uh, a regulatory and legal environment that is friendly to our cause as investors, right? We don't want you know, to have squatters in our house or, or even tenants that aren't paying rent and we can't get them out, okay? Uh, you know, in places like the Socialist Republic of California or the Socialist Republic of New York, you know, you, you can't, you, you just have no rights as a yeah. landlord. It's terrible. Um, you know, uh, people can move into your house illegally as squatters and they become tenants, basically. It's, it's insane. It's just complete insanity. Um, or if they're there as a legitimate tenant, they can just stop paying you and good yep. luck getting them out. It's going to be very difficult. You know, if you, if you have to take them to court, you are considered a big evil landlord. You know, and most of the time, you're not a big evil landlord. You're just someone who needs to pay the mortgage. Exactly. Okay? And, uh, you know, the judge is going to throw the book at you because you're just the evil big landlord and they're just the poor little tenant. So, you know, that's the assumption. It's uh, it's terrible. So that's definitely one of the things. And then everything else I said before is, uh, is really important. Got it. And talking about uh, tenants as well, um, or renting. So taking a little bit of a shift, uh, you mentioned earlier that because of how interest rates um, have been and how a lot of people have mortgages at a very low rate. A lot of people aren't moving, not that much supply. Um, so for those people who are, say, buying their first property, um, and maybe they're a newlyweds, for example, they can't find anything, uh, I'm assuming they likely become renters at that stage. Or have you seen any data around what people are doing when they can't actually get that property that they are looking for? Well, you know, unfortunately, there are really only three choices. You can buy, you can rent, you can be homeless, right? You know, that's that's about it. And someone, when I said that in one of my live conferences, they said, well, you can live with your parents. And you know, yeah, of course, only for that's so true. long. Um, only for so long. But um, uh, yeah, that, you know, that's the choice. At some point, you just have to make the jump. And when I started my career, I started selling HUD and VA repos in Southern California as, you know, a, a 19 year old, okay, uh, going to college part time and selling real estate part time for Century 21. And one of the things I noticed, you know, these were very cheap, crappy fixer upper properties, the vast majority of the time. And uh, I would sell to a lot of investors because that's the kind of property investors wanted to buy. But mm -hmm. I would also sell to a lot of first time buyers, right? So I'd have, you know, maybe a client that's, a, uh, you know, a nice Im immigrant family a lot of times or just 
you know, uh, American family that was just, you know, really trying to start out in life, okay, just young people, right? And, um, you know, one of the things I found with a lot of them is that most of the times in life, in order to take two steps forward, you got to take one step back and you got to adjust your expectations. And one of the keys to financial success and financial maturity is the ability to delay gratification. And, uh, you know, people that don't get ahead in life and that always seem to kind of be behind the eight ball, living on credit cards, renting an apartment, the rent is going up every year, and they just never get ahead, are the people that have always got to have all the gratification now, right? Yeah. They got to have the nicest place they can get now. You know, they can't wait. They can't take a step back and, you know, buy a house that, of course, never meets their expectations. Look, folks, life is all about compromises. Even rich people make lots of compromises, okay? That's life. We all just go in as, you know, hopefully rational actors. We go into the marketplace, we go into the economy, and we make the best decisions we can against what's available. And, you know, it's always compromise. So uh, you got to just be willing to get in the game. And, you know, maybe the house you buy won't be as nice as the house you could rent, mm -hmm. but you're going to be in the game and you're going to be building a future for yourself. Um, so many people in life uh, focus on the appearances of wealth rather than building real wealth. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of funny with me, right? I, I sort of think about the way I used to be now that I'm getting older, right? I think about how, what did I think when I was younger, right? I try to really like keep that perspective. And, you know, when I was younger and didn't have money, I wanted nice stuff. You know, I bought super nice cars. I bought super nice houses. And now I'm, you know, I'm super rich, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't care. I mean, I, I yeah. drive a sort of modest car. I live in a modest place. It's like, I, I just really don't care that much. It's more about that I'm interested in projects and I'm interested in impact and I'm interested in doing things that benefit, you know, future pe other people and future generations, right? That's more the focus rather than, you know, do I want to buy a new Mercedes, right? I, I just right. don't really care that much. It, it like doesn't matter to me. So you'd be surprised how many, you know, very wealthy people sort of project a pretty modest image. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I used to wear Armani suits all the time. Now I don't even have an Armani suit. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, it's just funny how that changes. Right. And, um, you know, but one of the things I did do throughout my life is I always, you know, spent less than I earned. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I had the position where I was making a pretty high income. So that was sort of like easy for me to say, right? Most people, you know, might say, well, Jason, you know, I don't have that high income. Well, you know, maybe work harder, you know, think differently, yeah. uh, make more effort, right? You know, you always got to give something up to get something. That's just the way the, the way it works, right? You know, uh, I mean, when, when I was a kid, my mom worked two jobs and, you know, we lived in a crappy little one bedroom apartment and, you know, I, I saw her do it. She yeah. uh, delayed gratification. And, you know, then uh, when she sort of hit her stride, she started getting really rich too, you know, but uh, there were a lot of years where it wasn't, you know, it was, she was way behind, like compared to her peers and her friends, you know, she didn't have the nice clothes and the nice car and the nice house and all that stuff. She sacrificed to build a longer, bigger vision for her life, you know? I love it. Yeah, very valuable words. I mean, uh, for those, so many people want to achieve financial freedom. And then when they kind of see like short videos, say on Instagram reels, they're like, oh, I could do this within a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And now, like you said, it takes a long time and you have to be willing to maybe be not in the same par appearance wise as people around you, um, but you're really building for the long term. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, Earl Nightingale, one of my early mentors that I was so lucky to discover at age 17, uh, he said, uh, don't be the person sitting in front of an empty fireplace and saying, give me heat, and then I'll put in the wood. You got to put the wood in first and the wood is the work, yeah. right? You got to go out and chop down the tree and put in the wood. <laughs> And then you'll get the heat. You don't get the heat first. Uh, so, you know, stop watching this bullshit on Instagram, folks, because yeah. a lot of those people are completely fake. They are just mm -hmm. these, a lot of these influencers are, are totally fake. They're, 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 
their wealth and their financial ability is like paper thin. It, it's just <laughs> not real. Okay. You're, you're falling for basically a TV show. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think you had so much value, Jason. And for those who are data-driven, want to follow you, follow what you're doing, how would they do so? Yeah, just, um, you know, my main website is jasonhartman.com. Of course, you can find me on YouTube. And my podcast, my my main podcast is called The Creating Wealth Show. So just type Jason Hartman you know, on any podcast platform. And, uh, you know, you can find me on all the usual social media places as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm on Instagram, uh, standing in front of lots of private jets and all that stuff. I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> that's what that's what all the influencers do. In fact, it's so funny when we were talking about that a moment ago. I saw this thing on YouTube, a video about this uh place, I think it's in LA, where they have like a fake private jet and all these influencers go in and sit oh in this studio that looks like they're in flying around on a private jet and they make videos. I mean, that's how, that's how completely fake this stuff is folks. Yeah. You know, the, the only place uh, success comes before work is in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, with that, thank you so much for your time, Jason. Really appreciate it. All right. My pleasure. Happy investing.